This is Friday Evening's Undercard. On our wrestling show today, Kamala loses his handler, Jake Roberts plays with a snake, and Hacksaw Duggan jumps over a guardrail. episode of Friday Evening's Undercard. I'm Gentleman John. I'm not on the line with Electrifying Eric today, but the man we've got on the other side of the line here is Thunderous Thurston. How you doing, man? I'm excellent, Gentleman John. How are you? I'm doing good, man. You like that Thunderous one? Because you're like all thundering on the on your little uh, your, your CB radios and stuff, right? <clears throat> yeah, back in the day. Reminds me of... Uh, what was it, Thursday Night Thunder on WCW? Oh, you know, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's what they called it. It's been a while. It was. It was definitely Thunder. Yeah, I totally mm-hmm. forgot about WCW Thunder. Yep. So what's your topic today, sir? Hey, man, we are on the May 2nd, 1987 episode of Saturday Night's Main Event. And just for a little background on this, it was taped on April 28th of 1987 because this is back in a time when WWF was taping everything and it was at Notre Dame University on the uh, on campus and we had Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura on the commentary. Mm-hmm. 30, what is that? Uh, yeah, about uh, 32 years ago. Yeah, it's just right at 32 years ago. Wow. Time flies. Absolutely. Jesse Ventura with his silver hair. Silver, yeah. uh, what, what, what's like that stuff that you, tinsel that you put on a Christmas tree? Jesse Ventura was always known for like these crazy outfits back then. I mean, it was like a highlight of the show to see what Jesse was going to be wearing. I forget which mm-hmm. one of the WrestleManias he came out in, but I swear to you, it was like a python skin jacket. I don't doubt it. Back in the 80s. Yeah, back when you wouldn't have been like just run off the air for doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got a comment about snakes later. Let's get into it, though. <laughs> All right, man. So, um, oh, hey, you were asking me off the air about like what sort of the deal was with the Saturday night's main event back then? Oh, yeah, because, uh, you know, how often was it taped and what medium did they, the WWF, put it over you know how big was cable back then or was it something that you know you had to go rent at blockbuster and put the thing in your machine and watch i mean is pay how big was pay-per-view was it a pay-per-view i don't really know the details because you know i've watched wcw mainly a little bit later yeah yeah i mean you, you being a wcw guy and that, that's certainly a relevant question to um to ask so this was the 11th saturday night's main event and uh, the first one premiered, it would have actually been right after WrestleMania 1. The first Saturday night's main event was May 11th of 1985. And so, uh, let's see, in 1987, they did one, two, three, four, five. So they did five events in 1987. Um, so it was not a monthly thing, but maybe about once every two months, they would do these. And... Actually, this is back in a time when these events were airing on broadcast television. You know, so now... A network? Yeah, they aired on NBC, actually. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, wow. For, for the modern fan, I mean, that's... It's unheard of to, to have professional wrestling on broadcast television. Um, mm-hmm. At least for a little while, obviously, we know... Uh, I don't remember when it's rolling out, but at, at some point in time in the very near future, uh, WWE is going to be on Fox. Yeah, that's kind of a surprise because I know that WWE is on USA and has been for a while, which is, of course, owned by NBC, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, NBC Universal owns USA now. Mm-hmm. So they're really going to shift things around for that when they do the Fox thing, but so broadcast TV? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know if it was like on cable because I know cable was on like in the infancy back then, and so it had, it, was, it had a pretty good audience, I would imagine. Then 
Yeah, it did. I don't have the TV numbers for this particular episode in front of me because like not all of them are, are published. But yeah, as far as like WWE programming back during this time, the primetime wrestling programs that uh, Eric and I cover each week on the program, those were on USA. Uh, they actually came on at, I think it was 8 o'clock on Mondays. But either way, it was the, it was the Raw time slot. Actually, when Raw came on in 93, it took the place of primetime wrestling. Mm -hmm. And then the other two uh, WWF shows, uh, I think, would have been Superstars of Wrestling and Wrestling Challenge. Don't, don't hold me to that, but I think that's what they were. They were syndicated shows, so they just went out to whatever networks wanted to pick them up in the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was the cool thing about Saturday Night's Main Event is that it was... Um, they they were a big deal because they were on they they were on um broadcast TV you know they were on network television yeah that's when it was getting huge you know of course the manias wrestlemanias came out so it was really starting to take off so i could see the numbers being pretty good on network television you know you got hogan you know and and uh <clears throat> the giant people like that doing main events i mean that's that's something to watch so it really, I guess, butted back then, you know? Yeah, it, it definitely did. And so I'm going to give you, if I can find it here. Yeah, here it is. So uh, this was, they, they called it the main event, but at the end of the day, it, it was a Saturday night's main event. It was from February 5th of 1988. And this is the really famous one where Andre the Giant beats Hulk Hogan for the championship. And so now we would think about doing that on, on pay-per-view and you would think it was crazy. But listen to this. This show did a 15.2 rating with 33 million viewers. <laughs> That's excellent. Considering what is raw, you know, your average raw is 3 million on a good day. Yeah, something like that. It's probably, yeah, about a three rating, maybe three or four million viewers. But yeah, I mean, it was that speaks to how big wrestling was and how popular this was on uh, network TV. Yeah. Well, with those two, I can, I can imagine, I guess Hulkamania was already in full swing by, by that time. Oh yeah. I mean, that was after, you know, that was after WrestleMania three and that's actually what ended up leading into the, um, the tournament for the championship at WrestleMania four. Um, but anyway, obviously that's getting way into the future, but it does give you an idea of just how many people were watching these shows. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that there probably was 15 million people tuned in to watch uh, this show that we're talking about. Sounds just like a, the, the predecessor to Raw, just less frequent. Well, in some ways, this would have actually been a predecessor to the monthly pay-per-views. Because at this point in time, WWE had only run three pay-per-views total, and those were actually the three WrestleManias. Um, it was later in 1987, in November, that they brought the Survivor Series in. But that was only the fourth pay-per-view that they ever ran. So really, these Saturday night's main events were sort of the, the pay-per-view of the era. And it, you know, you think about it, if you're getting 10, 15, 20 million people to watch these shows, they're probably just as lucrative as these pay-per-views are when the pay-per-views are getting, you know, maybe 200,000 buys. And of course now the network's got that sort of all skewed, but you had to watch these to keep up with what was going on back then. Yeah, you did. And, and they would cover it like on, uh, superstars and stuff like that but yeah these were definitely part of the show i mean if, if you wanted to keep up with what wwf was doing in 1987 i mean you, you were tuned in to saturday night's main event that's uh, that's definite lots lots of drama which um you know the whole miss elizabeth thing with macho man you had to you had to keep going with that yeah and so hey um you want we, we can probably go ahead and get into the the show with the matches and stuff now, yeah. Yeah, let's go over the card. Okay, yeah. So I mean, just the, the show started off with a promo. You get Savage, and then you get Steamboat. 
obviously they're coming off hot from the match at WrestleMania. Um, mm-hmm. They go back and forth. You get a Hart Foundation saying they're going to get a rematch against the Bulldogs. Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's Hacksaw, right? And then you get the Heenan and Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan, and you get the big sort of like a blow-off promo there coming off of WrestleMania, and that's sort of the cold open of the show, if, if you want to call it that. Yeah, yeah, it was... Uh... A lot of WrestleMania was involved. WrestleMania three was involved in this in this program, like you said, just the, the blow the blow offs and a lot of those promos, especially the one Hulk Hogan did with uh, Giant. A lot of that going on. Uh, what was the what was the first match? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so the first match of the night would have been Kamala against Jake Roberts. That's right. Um. So there there was a segment before that uh did, did you catch sort of the the heenan ken patera debate thing like, did, did you have any questions coming out of that no not really um i watched it on the network they had it pretty edited pretty tight so i'm not sure if everything was there because it was a what a 90 minute program it was down to about an hour uh, yeah the so the, the, the whole thing with the the ken patera angle and it, it's been being played out on uh, primetime wrestling. Ken Patera had just gotten out of jail and he was basically blaming everything on Bobby Heenan. And so they, they had this big debate where um, I think Ken Patera basically like grabbed him by the necktie or something like that and was slinging him around, right? Oh, you're talking about the, the, the neck brace? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember a little bit about that. Uh, Heenan playing that well. Oh, yeah. Bobby Heenan is classic. I mean, anything Bobby Heenan is in in this time is just classic stuff. He's absolutely one of the best. Yeah, he's a he's a great. Yeah, he's probably the yeah, he was representing two people on that uh, on that show that night. Uh, yeah, not d- definitely not uncommon. I, I think he represented four people at WrestleMania. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, um, Kamala comes out and it was with Jake the Snake and. It's amazing the the stuff that they that he would do with that snake, and you, you just compare that to watching TV today, and you just think, man, that would never happen today, ever. You know, just throwing this gigantic python or whatever on people, I can't see that flying today. No, it it probably uh-huh. wouldn't go. And there's there's some other stuff that he does with the snake later, um, and I'm not even talking about the lewd stuff he did at like the Heroes of Wrestling show. What did you think about that footage that they gave from the snake pit where? Um, Honky Tonk hits Jake Roberts with the guitar. Yeah, that was, uh, it, it was corny. I, I've got to tell you. Um, I mean, it was, it was classic. Uh, kind of reminded me of, uh, Jeff Jarrett a lot, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was all right. I haven't seen much of the Honky Tonk man. I really got exposed to him on this, on this program. Um, and he, he who was, he was with, uh, Kamala that night as well. Uh, he was, uh, what was he dressed up as? I forget the guy that he was dressed up as, but he was at ringside and nobody knew that it was yeah, so the honky-tonk man all along. To, to give a little background on that. So the, the thing from the snake pit, to do a little quick one on that, Jake Roberts has said for years that that guitar was not gimmicked, that they had done nothing to like weaken it. And so honky hit him with like an actual real guitar and Jake has said over and over that because Honky hit him with a guitar that wasn't gimmicked, that it that's what caused him to be addicted to painkillers and all this, that, and the other. And uh, Honky has disputed that quite a bit. Well, I didn't see the guitar split in half by, you know, where it comes together at the neck. You know, there was just a big hole in the back. I didn't see it split where they normally weaken it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how much. Yeah. You, you never know who to believe as, as far as those two guys, because they're both they're, they're, they're both really interesting. If you go on YouTube and watch some of the interviews with both of them, they're, they're some interesting guys. Real time heat between the two because of this and uh, in real life. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think they've still got heat like now. Um you know, I I don't think they say too many friendly words to each other even now. And I mean, it's thirty years later. And you know, Jake the Snake's not not doing too well at all. So, um, 
But yeah, uh, so the the thing with Kamala, I, I think they described it a little bit. So that's you can actually thank Jerry Lawler for that Kamala gimmick because they brought that out of Memphis, and his whole thing was that they made up that he was basically this savage from Uganda. And that's why he was called the Ugandan giant. And, you know, they, they make like he's a cannibal and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so the guy in the costume, I mean, he's, it's, it's like a full jumpsuit and then it's like a hood and then it's a, um, it, it's like a jungle hat. Yeah. So his name is Kim Chi. That was it. I'm not making mm-hmm. this up. It's Kim Chi. Normally, I think Kim Chi was, Steve Lombardi, who's the Brooklyn brawler. But for this one, All right. they had it be the Honky Tonk Man because uh, Jake Roberts and Honky Tonk wrestled a match at WrestleMania, so they're still sort of blowing that feud off coming here. Yeah, it makes sense, and um, it worked. <laughs> but um... Yeah, but, I mean, not a heck of a lot to say. I mean, you, you, you're not going to see a Kamala match that's, like, really – a technical masterpiece. He just, it's not what he did. He was just a big guy and he worked like that. Jake could wrestle decent matches when he wanted to, but you know, it it wasn't really the point here. Kamala wins with a big splash after, um, Mr. Fuji's distracting him. And, and then you get sort of the, the beat up where, um, honky tonk man takes the, takes the mask off and comes in and beats up Jake. Yeah, all Jake really, to me, was getting was a foot to the face through the ropes, it seemed, for half the match. Uh, you know, he would put his foot in his face, and then he would walk away, and he'd come back and he'd put his foot in his face again. Uh, and it wasn't, obviously, a spot fest for this huge dude, <laughs> you know, wearing a, a loincloth. Yeah, and that's... I'm not, yeah, Kamala is mm-hmm. not the most like PC friendly character for the modern audience. No, no, not at not at all. I was thinking about that. I, I, I was thinking there's a lot of things going on in this program that wouldn't fly today. No, there, there's a lot going on here. And you know the the funny thing, and so th- this is like inside the story, right? That Kamala's like this wild savage who would just go crazy if Kim Chi's not there. So as I'm watching this, like the notes that I have is like, wait a minute, wouldn't Kamala just go crazy and like start eating people without Kim Chi as handler there? Like, how did he get back to the dressing room? He didn't have his handler. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. Well, you're thinking a lot. Who was the dude with the suit or almost like a tuxedo and he had like a red, red star or something painted around his eye and he had the top hat? Oh, that was Mr. Fuji. Oh, okay. So. And he he's the spokespiece? Yeah, I don't. Mr. Fuji's like a weird one because he was a manager for the longest time, and he was like a big heel manager. But the thing is, mm-hmm. I guess when he first got over as a heel, it would have been about 1955, and it wasn't hard to make it believe that a Japanese guy was a bad guy in 1955. But by this time you're pretty far removed from the idea that Japanese people are bad guys. And so he had this like massive accent. And so it was like really hard to understand him. So I don't understand how he ended up being a, um, a real manager, but uh, yeah, he won a couple tag team championships in WWE or WWF, like way back in the seventies. And he actually ended up managing Yokozuna when he came into WWF in the early nineties. Makes sense. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick break. If you want to follow us on social media, we can be found on Instagram at Friday Evenings Undercard, on Twitter at F Undercard, on Facebook by going to Facebook.com slash Friday Evenings Undercard, or you can reach us via email at Friday Evenings Undercard at gmail.com. Please have a listen to our newest interviews with Ohio Valley Wrestling Stars Dimes and our upcoming interview with Justin Smooth. And also our interview with Pro Wrestling Hall of Famer Bobby Fulton. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Give us that five-star review on iTunes. It'd mean a lot to us. Now let's get you right back to the action. All right, and after that, we get a Lumberjack match. And now there's a lot of stuff we could talk about with the Lumberjack match, but it's George Steele against the Macho Man. Now you probably know a lot about the Macho Man, but I'm going to bet this is your first exposure to George Steele. I know George the Animal Steele. Um... Played a really good dumb guy 
again, one of those things that I don't think would fly too well in today's PC environment. Well, I don't know. They did Eugene in 2006. Even 2006, not 2019. But, That's true. So, but the real. So he had a thing for Miss Elizabeth and the. Cafe world there. Yes, and that had been going on for quite a long time. Um, George Steele and the Macho Man had actually wrestled for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania two, and then I believe it was the Saturday night's main event immediately before this one, so I think back in February, they had some match where they were competing to have Miss Elizabeth be their manager, where she was like trying to be both their managers. Mm-hmm. But you get yeah. you, you get that ridiculous scene in the back where Gene Okerlund's trying to interview him, and he's like, he doesn't even know what's going on. This just isn't right, Vince. Well, wasn't uh, <clears throat> this is the one where the dragon came in and kind of was helping out George, wasn't he, in this match? Yeah, Ricky Steamboat sort of seconded him to the ring. You know, overall... And wasn't he, as a lumberjack, didn't he keep beating Randy's butt? Once he got tossed outside. Yeah, he did. And so... Because he had the... the Ricky had a belt of some point at, at, at that uh, event. Yeah, right at this point, Ricky would have been the Intercontinental Championship. He won the Intercontinental Championship off Macho at WrestleMania three, And so they were still going at it. And then mm-hmm. um, you had... So I've got a list of the Lumberjacks. I'll go through them real quick. Iron Sheik, Danny Davis, Jim Neidhart, Bret Hart, Honky Tonk Man, Hercules, Davey Boy Smith, Dynamite Kid, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Ricky Steamboat, Tom Zink, Rick Martell, Tito Santana, Nikolai Volkoff, and Kim Chi, the handler. The real Kim Chi? Yeah. Yeah, the real Kim Chi. So to paint the picture, Davis, Jim Neidhart, and Bret Hart, those were the Hart Foundation. It's too long of a story to get into how Danny Davis fits in there here. But they were feuding with Davey Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid. And those guys had a match later in the show. And so they were going at it outside the ring. Hacksaw Jim Duggan had just debuted in WWF. And he had this big program going with the Iron Sheik and Volkoff. Mm -hmm. Steamboat's got a big thing going with Macho. And so I actually wrote down that I thought this is probably the best lumberjack match that I've ever seen. Now, I know with WCW, like, lumberjack matches weren't really, like, a big thing. At least I don't remember them being no. a big thing. Yeah, me neither. But they they do them they, – they used to do them relatively often in WWF because it's like you just got the guys in the locker room, so you just bring them out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, Ricky just kept beating – Beating his butt as soon as he, it, was, it seemed like just him outside. Yeah, going after Randy. Yeah, I mean they they did, and so just to like look at it, you've got the Hart Foundation and you've got the Bulldogs. They're fighting on the outside. You've got Zink and Martell. Those were a tag team, and they're fighting the Russians, Volkov and Sheik. Hacksaw Duggan's mm-hmm. fighting Volkov and Sheik. Hercules and Ricky Steamboat are fighting because they're about to start a program. Ricky Steamboat's going at it with the Macho Man. And it's just, it's great, like, the way it works. So, like, you know George Steele's, you know, probably not going to win because it is Randy Savage, and, I mean, he's he's sort of the main event talent. Yes. But, yeah, I mean, I and then, I, I thought that was a really cool match for, for a Lumberjack match. Like, all this mess that was going on outside actually made sense. It made sense why these 20 guys are out there that they actually don't like each other and they're trying to fight each other out there. And it was just, it was a pretty good match for me. Is this the one where Davis, the Davis guy, interfered? at the end or caused a pinfall. I forget the one that was with the heart foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got my notes here that, uh, Davis, he runs into the ring, hits George Steele with the ring bell and then macho drops the elbow on him for the win. I was looking at that cover. If I'm thinking it's the right one, it didn't look like a full three to me. Looked like he got off the shoulders before that third one. Just something to think about or look at. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they would do little things like that back then, you know, just to keep it going. Be like, hey, man, you didn't actually pin me for three. I know the ref counted three, but you weren't on me when he counted three. Um, I don't mm-hmm. know if that actually comes up later. But, um, yeah, it was definitely something that they would do. Tune into the next show for the answer. Tune in next week.
So I, That's right. I don't have it in my notes. Did George Steele try to eat a turnbuckle cover in this match? I don't remember seeing any of that. He went for Randy's ear a couple of times. Yeah, that that <laughs> that was George Steele's gimmick. He would like go over in the corner, and I guess he had like a knife blade tucked somewhere because there's no way there's no way you're gonna bite through that big canvas ring cover. I guess he would like open it up somehow and he would like tear it open with his mouth and he'd be like spilling all the, the foamy contents of this ring cover just all over the place. And it, it was this crazy scene because obviously he's, I out think there. I would have remembered that. Yeah. Cause I mean, he looks like a madman. He's got like a green tongue and just all kinds of stuff. He's a weird looking guy. And by the way, yeah, and, uh, just to show that entertainment does not reflect real life, that man in the ring, George Steele was a high school teacher in the state of Michigan who had a master's degree. Yeah. Master's degree. Uh, yes. Like you said, in Michigan and that crazy guy, I, I, he did his gimmick so well. It was so believable that he was just that challenged. You know, it's, it, it was believable. I had to look it up. Like, is this guy really that, you know, you know, it's a gimmick, but he just played it so well. You, you're curious. I think that's what it's all about, you know? Yeah, for sure. All right. Next, you get a interview, Gene Okerlund, and um, he's interviewing Heenan and Andre. This just continues a lot of the Heenan stuff. Um, he's talking about how the referees and Jack Tunney's biased. Um, if, if you look back at the Hogan match, I mean, there, there was kind of a controversy in it where they thought Andre got a three count at the very early in the match. And so they, they talk about that, and obviously Heenan is sitting there in the neck brace, and he's, he's selling the neck brace from Ken Patera. I, I don't really have anything else about that segment. I don't know if you got anything. Uh, well, yeah, of course, it shows the crappy camera angle from WrestleMania and how the Giant got screwed, and he demands that investigation right now. On They were cheating and yada, 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 and, of course, he was selling that neck brace. And uh, the Giant really didn't say a whole lot. Yeah, that would pretty much uh, sum that promo up, huh? Yeah. Or that interview. That's, that's about it. Uh, next match, you get a tag team championship match. The uh, British Bulldogs, Davy Boy Smith and the Dynamite Kid against the Hart Foundation. Two out of three falls, we hear. I thought it was a decent match. Yeah, I mean, it was a good match. You got some good stuff. I mean, th th these are four guys who... Not only are they all four really good workers, but they're all four guys who have been working with each other for a long time. Right. Because all four of these guys came from the old Calgary territory, so they've been working with each other for a long time. <clears throat> yeah, I thought the British Bulldog, I didn't really think he was honestly from Britain, but he is. Yeah. I mean, he moved to Cal Calgary. <laughs> okay, so you know what the, the British Bulldog's like name that they call him on screen is, right? Uh, remind me. So they call him Davy Boy Smith. Okay, you remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Funny story. Boy is literally his middle name, like on his birth certificate. Well, there you go. It all makes sense. <laughs> because apparently, <laughs> I think I think the story that I've read is that when they were basically they were trying to write down that the gender was boy, and they wrote it down in the wrong place. So legally, when it got like read into the records. Boy was his middle name, which hmm. is just unbelievable. I mean, that's just like a crazy, you know, little tidbit. So uh, on that match, I'm trying to remember if there was any screws or anything like that. I don't recall. Well, so was. what I have is you have the Bulldogs win the first fall by disqualification. And then let's see. Then Jim Neidhart gets a pinfall. Oh, hang on. What do I have here? Eh, whatever. The Bulldogs actually won the match two falls to one, but because one of the falls was a disqualification, they didn't win the belts. Mm. And I remember as I was, I remember as I was watching the match, I was like, I wonder if that's going to come into play because that's like, that's like a rule, but this is pro wrestling. So you know that like, well, what's a rule? <laughs> Were belts always on the line in events like this back then, like you had, you know, main event every other month or so did every single match. Was that a, a, a strap on the line? 
Uh, maybe not every match, but yeah, I mean, they, they were, these events were, unless you lived in markets that televised the house shows, so unless you lived in like New York and Philly and Boston and stuff like that, where they would actually televise the house shows from Madison Square Garden, uh, these shows were the only shows that you were going to see where a lot of these guys were even on there. Like Hulk Hogan, if you go back and look, Hulk Hogan was not a wrestler you saw on TV back in this time. Like he simply was not on TV, at least not wrestling matches. He may have been in some segments, but he was not wrestling matches on TV. If you wanted to see Hulk Hogan wrestle, you went to the arena. And so just because he was too big just to put uh, butts in seats. Well, like he would wrestle on the shows where they would tape all the um, like the superstars or wrestling matches. But he would be in a dark match, so it wasn't recorded. And the the logic back during this time period was is you didn't put your main event guys on TV because you wanted people to have to pay to see them at the arena. Now they don't care. They they run a pay-per-view card every Monday and every Tuesday. And so that's kind of killed their live event business because who cares? But, you know. So would you say that Hulk Hogan back then was uh, used like Brock Lesnar is used today as far as showing up whenever? Not every single Raw he's at. He shows up to a Raw here and there, usually close to a pay-per-view, and then that's the only time you see Brock actually wrestle is at a pay-per-view. Yes and no, because Hulk Hogan was probably wrestling 300 nights a year back during this time. I mean, he was on a show six to seven nights a week, uh, every week. You know, maybe one week he only wrestled five, but you, you get the idea. So he was. You just didn't see him. He just wasn't on TV. It's like if if you wanted to see Hulk Hogan wrestle a match, you had to pay to go to Madison Square Garden, or you had to pay to go to whatever the arena closest to you was when they were there. If you wanted to see Hulk Hogan, that's what you had to do. You had to go to the building to see him. He just he he just was not on television. And we saw him, but uh, only on recorded promos. He wasn't doing anything other than that on this right. And so event we're talking about. that's actually something that Eric and I noted. I don't remember if it was last week or if it was the week before, but there was it was a tag team match. It was a six man tag team match that had Hulk Hogan in it. And we mentioned that this was five or six weeks removed from WrestleMania, and this was the first time we saw Hulk Hogan on this television show. And so. As far as like how much he was on TV and how much he was wrestling on TV, yes, he was like Brock Lesnar. But the difference is, is that he was working every night because he was defending the championship every single night, and it he just wasn't on TV because they didn't want to like waste Hulk Hogan by putting him on TV. Right. Well, I mean, it makes sense, sort of, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, in- in, in the time back then, it definitely makes sense because that's when your live event business was the main part of the business. It's not like now where, you know, the main part of the business is uh, your, your your television stuff. And it can get tiring seeing the same person on every single show every single week. That it can. We won't mention any names. Yeah, I know. Everybody. You don't have to. It's, it's everybody. You, you yeah. see everybody every week and, jeez. Okay. They, don't, they still don't have time to cram them all in three hours. All right, moving yeah, on. Yeah, let's uh, let's we're we're getting up we're getting up close to that time here. Hercules against Ricky Steamboat. Uh, you see Macho Man in the back, and Macho says he wants Ricky to win because he wants to get the belt back from Ricky Steamboat. Um, was was this one of those times where they have Macho looking at one of those like little like like a TV monitor? Back there, yeah, he was sitting down. Yeah, he was sitting down, staring at a TV monitor, which was not flickering, so it looked like it was probably just on a white screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was. <laughs> it wasn't Gene Okerlund back there with him. Jimmy, yeah, Gene rather, and uh, Miss Elizabeth were just back there standing, and and Macho was babbling at the TV. And you're right, he wanted uh, Steamboat to keep the belt. So he could get it back from him, which brings in the interference and stuff like that on the match. Yeah. I mean, coming up. Yeah. I mean, really a pretty good match. 
it does what it does. Macho Man gets um, Hercules disqualified because he wanted Steamboat to keep the belt. Um, Hercules had him locked in that big full Nelson, and that's when Macho comes running out of the back. He breaks up the full Nelson, and um, eventually you end up with uh, Herc getting disqualified. Right. So Steamboat wins by DQ, and uh, it's kind of a a garbage ending, but I guess it makes sense for the storyline. Yeah, yeah. Steamboat looked really good in this pay-per-view, I thought. Uh, I was like, man. He looked so young. I mean, we're talking 1987, though, but he, he looked good. Yeah, I mean, Steam, Steamboat looks good, obviously, pretty much anywhere he goes. Obviously, not too long after this, he takes a little bit of time off where he kind of has a family, and then he goes to WCW where he works that unbelievable program with Ric Flair in um, 1989 where they, you know, some of the best matches ever. And uh, Hercules, was that's just a huge dude as well. Yeah, so there there was a funny story. I heard it on Jim Cornette's podcast the other week. He's like, we were driving back from a town, and he's like, Hercules and his girlfriend left, and I was behind them, and I see this car. I'm driving down the road, and I see this car. They're driving like 15 miles an hour on the shoulder, and I pull up, and it's Hercules, and he's like, well, I had to stop to go to the bathroom on the side of the road, and I didn't look, and I opened my door, and a semi-truck hit my door. And now my driver's door won't close. And Cornette's like, <laughs> man, that's crazy that it didn't get ripped off. And Herc goes, yeah, man, thank God I was holding on to it. <laughs> so he's sitting there holding on to the door and a semi truck hits it and it doesn't knock the door off. And it obviously doesn't like completely just, you know, sever his arm. And it's just unbelievable. Yeah, he was a I think he was a pro bodybuilder. He was in magazines and whatnot. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's got a great physique. And so after that, you end up with your last match of the night. You got the Can-Am connection, Rick Martell and Tom Zink, and obviously Jim Duggan. Yes, he's in the front, front seat, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim Duggan's coming out, and they're going against Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik and with Slick. Yeah, so Duggan was, Duggan was in the front row. Of course, he's Mr. America Man. You know, he's got the... Yeah, he's got Star Spangled got the, Banner tied around his head. Yeah, and he got the two before with probably the little American flag taped to it. Yeah, the uh the the worked two by four. That thing that thing was a gimmick two by four, I believe. Balsa wood. Yeah, balsa wood. Sawed in half, practically. So they come out, Volkov comes out with the Russian flag, and I guess back then the USSR was still together yeah, and then, you know yeah, it was communism this and there was a black guy out there who looked like a pimp i don't know who that was but he looked like a spokespiece for them do you remember who i'm talking about yeah that's slick um slick. yeah that's 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 his name that's what he went by on screen um yeah i mean I, I don't think he was like legitimately a pimp or that they were playing him off as that uh but yeah i mean that that mm -hmm. was his thing he um I want to say, I don't remember if they did it then, but I know at some point they started calling him Reverend Slick, which is funny because he is actually a preacher in real life. I believe. Wow. Yeah, could you no, I didn't know that. that. But yeah, he kept, because they did a promo and he kept talking about communism. And of course, 87, the, the Cold War was still going on. So that was a big deal. Yeah. So you, you've got Jim Duggan, who has this like all American gimmick. And then you have a Soviet and an Iranian on a tag team in 1987. That is a quick way to get some serious heat. Yeah. And they, I think they continue to use that gimmick type thing today, you know, all the way up to Rusev. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. What, what was he like a hero of the Russian Federation or something they call Rusev? Yeah, and you can't be rolling out in a tank at WrestleMania. That was pretty cool. That was cool. actually pretty cool. <laughs> Anywho. But yeah, you, you get hats so, all running into the ring as Volkov is singing. There was a really, really stiff-looking abdominal stretch from the from the Sheik. Like, I mean, it looked like he really had that worked in. Mm -hmm. And other than that, you just had the Sheik get pinned on a roll-up. So, hey, you get your faces going over and crowds going home happy. 
And every match was about five minutes or so. Some were four, some were six, but I never saw anything over over six to seven minutes. And then, yeah, nothing I've, less than I've actually four. I got the times right here. So the the Kamala match went uh, four minutes and eighteen seconds. The lumberjack match went six minutes forty four. The uh, two out of three falls match for the the tag belts was the longest match. It was nine minutes and forty eight seconds. Uh, the Rick, oh, okay. Ricky Steamboat match went 640, and this last match went 445. Kept it short and sweet, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. You know, at, at this time, like, WWF wasn't really known for doing um, some really long, you know, yeah, they, they, they weren't giving you hour-long matches, you know what I mean? And the time slot was precious, and precious, and you're on network. TV. Yeah, I mean, so they were definitely going to keep that one to uh, to the time. And Earl Hebner was the official on a lot of those matches, I believe. Yeah. It might have actually been Dave because they're twins. Really? Okay. And um, not to uh, not to spoil it for the listeners at home, even though it has been 30 years, that the twin thing actually comes up in a pretty substantial match in about um, six or seven months here. More to follow. Yeah, more to follow. But, yeah, you, you talk about, like, the time of matches. So even the Ricky Steamboat uh, Macho Man match from WrestleMania, which everybody just raves about as being this unbelievable, just awesome match, was 14 minutes and 35 seconds. I just kind of looked that up real quick. You know, so WWF was not about long matches back then. It, it's not like with the... I don't even know if it was like Jim Crockett territory, but, you know, mid-Atlantic wrestling or, or, or whichever one of those territories you want to call it, where they would routinely go to like a one-hour draw. You just weren't seeing that. I think a good, no, I guess not. A decent WrestleMania match these days is 30 minutes, I would think, on average. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're going pretty long. I mean, let me, let me take a quick look here, see if I can find a recent WrestleMania card. So let's see. This is actually last year's WrestleMania. I'm actually surprised it came up so fast. So the longest match on the card last year, and of course this is not exactly a, a groundbreaking show last year, but the longest match on the show was the Kurt Angle Ronda Rousey tag team match, and it went 20 minutes and 40 seconds. Really? That's yeah. it? Yeah. AJ Styles and Nakamura hmm. went uh, 20 minutes and 20 seconds. Hmm. That's interesting shorter than I would think. Yeah, I mean, you, you you can never tell with, like, how long some of these goes. I don't actually remember. I think I went and looked. I don't remember the last time there was a full-on 30-minute match at WrestleMania. Daniel Bryan matches? Mm, they went close, but I don't think they went over 30. Yeah. yeah. I can actually find that pretty quick. Just give me about 10 seconds here and it'll be there. So let's see. This is WrestleMania 30, because obviously that's the one you're talking about. You're not talking about the Eight second match at uh, no, uh, I'm not talking about Seamus. Uh, so let's see the first match of the night, the one where he went against Hunter, went 25 minutes and 58 seconds, and that was actually the longest match on the show. The second longest match on the show that night was Brock against The Undertaker, and how long was that? Uh, 25 minutes and 12 seconds. And so, obviously, that was an hour long segment because it takes Undertaker 10 minutes to get to the ring, and it took him. God, 15 to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last match of the night where it was uh, Brian and Batista and Randy, that one went 23 minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, longer than what we saw on this event. Yeah, I mean, yeah, d d definitely longer than than what we saw here. That's for sure. Of course, this WrestleMania this year is probably going to be about seven hours long, I imagine. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I don't. I didn't watch like all of the show last year, but I know I did watch all of WrestleMania 33, and I, I swear to you, I think I started watching at five o'clock, and it didn't end until nearly midnight. I mean, sounds it right. Just it just doesn't make sense. So back to the show. That was the that was the final match. Yeah, I yep. believe. Yep. Can Am and Zink against the or uh, Zink and Martell against Volkov and the Sheik. Yeah, that was the. That was the final match. Got to send the crowd home happy. And um and that was it. 
and we saw Macho Man on this on this program, and he was a main event, top card guy. Yeah, and obviously this is sort of the start of Macho Man's real rise to the top. You know, he he lost the match at WrestleMania, but now they're um, they're starting to push him into that main event role, and obviously he's going to be there. Uh, by the time we get around to WrestleMania four, he's he's going to be in the the big tournament for the championship. Uh, once we get there, yeah, I thought he was actually kind of tame on this show compared to what he could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they were trying to build him like slow. I mean, you, you didn't get the crazy like promos where he's pulling like the coffee creamers out of his hand and um, right, you know, all, all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, he he didn't have that here, but um. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, you had a, a pretty good, actually, wrestling show. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was good. It was entertaining for me. I think the time was right. You know, I was interested all the way to the end. Yeah, and that's probably not something we can say for most of the wrestling we see on TV nowadays. No. And it's like, oh, it actually held my attention throughout the throughout the program. Yeah, three hours. That's that's a whole nother conversation right there. But yeah, yeah this for sure. this keeps your attention. You're not worried about bathroom breaks. Yeah, you you don't have to worry about whether you need to set the DVR because you might have to might have to go make your dinner in the middle of the show. Probably be doing that on Sunday. Who knows? Oh gosh, absolutely. All right, man. So well, um, that takes us just about to the end here. So uh, you you got any final thoughts on the episode before we wrap it up? No, I don't think so. It was good. Uh, on to the next show, which is, uh, what, in September, I think. Uh, maybe, maybe yep, not. That'll maybe. be the next Saturday night's main event, and we'll cover a lot of primetime wrestling between now and then. But, uh, hey, man, I appreciate you coming on the show on such uh, such short notice. Not a problem. Always a pleasure, yeah, man. Gentleman John. <laughs> Thanks, brother. We'll talk to you later. Yeah, man. Yeah. And for all of the audience out there, we appreciate you listening all the way to here. Okay,